this is uh, comms, artificial intelligence survival exchange session three, um, the future challenges and ethical considerations for museum communicators, uh, sponsored by ICOM MPR, soon to be officially ICOM comms, or I guess now officially ICOM comms. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Christiana Kazaku for herding cats throughout this whole process and getting this whole thing kind of organized and uh, for putting all three sessions together and making sure that they uh, had the right uh, participants and presenters. Um, and also Deborah Ziska for sort of the idea for this series um, and uh, sponsoring it through ICOM comms. Um, so we have a panel discussion today uh, with uh, four panelists and I will be moderating. Um, the, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Marion Carey, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of Ask Mona, an AI powered platform that helps cultural institutions enhance their visitor engagement through cutting edge technology. Um, she's collaborating with over 200 European cultural organizations and frequently speaks at international conferences on the future of AI in culture and continues to push the boundary of how technology can transform cultural engagement. We also have with us Dr. Mathilde Pavi, uh, who is the legal consultant, a legal consultant specializing in artificial intelligence for creative and cultural industries. Uh, she currently serves as expert consultant on AI to the United Nations. Uh, she is also um, works with content creators, media producers, and AI innovators and policymakers to support responsible AI. Um, and she's a speak frequent uh, author yeah. and commentator uh, with uh, regular appearances on the BBC, the, the Times, and the Financial Times in the UK. Uh, also with us, we have two uh, representatives from uh, the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Dr. Jane Thaller, a knowledge and data manager uh, and the associate registrar uh, for data management there, as well as Michelle Padilla, uh, a museum professional with uh, 20 years of marketing, PR, and digital initiatives experience in art, children's history, and natural history museums. Um, so there's our panel. And I'm uh, James Heaton, founder of Tronvig, uh, brand strategy and uh, advertising agency in New York City, uh, and also sponsor of the Museum Marketing Communications and Audience Engagement Glossary uh, that is currently functioning in English and Spanish, thanks to ICOM. Uh, so with that, we will begin. Uh, so first, let me just open with uh, kind of a general sort of question. Uh, where does the cultural sector sort of fit in into the AI economy? Um, uh, a, a massive sort of tidal wave style economy that uh, saw uh, in the previous year uh, 142 billion in global investment, and that is uh, going to be trillions in the uh, current uh, year and beyond. So as a sector, we're kind of tiny in the economics of this. So what role can we play? Anyone from the panel jump in on that? or anyone else actually for format purposes, please, anyone who's participating in the webinar, please feel free to speak up. You don't have to type your question into the chat. You can, if you would like, but if you simply want to contribute your 
on an equal stage with everyone else. So please just jump in uh, with your comments or questions. Um, I will add that the um, American Alliance of Museums, AAM, has said that the, the museum and cultural sector add um, $50 billion to the US economy each year. And that's according to their economic What's it called the economic impact statement from 2020. That's right. More more than all so, professional sports combined, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I think in that sense, I mean, we can be and maybe should be. Uh, that's arguable, but a large player in the a AI and how it's used and a lot of the things that go with it, the ethics the sustainability, all of that. We, we are in a position to be um, leaders hmm. in, the, in second, that field. I second that. I think the AI, the investment into AI is huge the and real, like we can measure it, like we have numbers for that. There is also an expectation that AI will contribute hugely to the economy, like all sectors combined. That actually is an estimate number that varies wildly depending on the report you you know you look at which is a kind of a projection we don't know for sure but what we know which i found super interesting is that and it contributes to this perception that the heritage sector is a bit like decentered from this whole conversation is that if we look at where the ai investment goes like which sectors applications it goes into most of the studies and reports or indexes that track that don't even look at the culture sector. At best, we hear about the media and comms, which, you know, the heritage sector doesn't fit neatly into that, really. Um, and it's not it, it even tracked as a piece of information. And if we look, you know, those are not the industries that tend to get the AI investment, which is, I think is something we'll pick up later. So it feels on the margin, but if you look what what AI needs to be made and it needs data with, you know, human created content, potentially cultural collections. Actually, that's a resource like the heritage sector is a key custodian, if not producer of that resource, which is an interesting paradox to see a sector that massively contributes to that innovation yet is not serviced or served by it. So I think there's a dual reason to have it recentered onto to have AI strategies, both by regulators, policymakers, but also investors recentered um, towards the heritage sector. Well, this relates to the, the reference to the new oil uh, from the first webinar, right? That the, that the cultural collections and assets are a tremendous value that is largely untapped. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and I completely agree with this idea of uh, arts and culture being maybe the main provider uh, for artificial intelligence because of all the contents it produces and make available for artificial intelligence uh, makers. So I think this is something that is really important. And it, it's the same for every new technology, but the cultural sector is always kind of underlooked. And sometimes when you have the use of a new technology in this sector, people are like, oh, that's brand new. It's going to uh, renew uh, the cultural sector and everything. Whereas uh, most of the time, museums and uh, cultural professionals are among the first to, came to try to experiment with new technology. And the same with artists. You have a lot of artists that's at the forefront and the beginning of um, a switch, a switch in technology, start to play with it to kind of uh, uh, in interrogate and explore what it can bring to society. So <laughs> I think it's a common bias, uh, which is not representative of what's actually happening. Hmm. What, what? So yeah. So following up with you, kind of. Th this is one of my sort of follow-on questions, but. I think that AI as a technology has not really been designed uh, for the cultural sector. So what does the cultural sector sort of do about that? I know you're working on that in your business. Um, so so what is what is the responsibility of the cultural sector or communicators within the cultural sector to kind of deal with that reality? Um, I think that the tools that are at the forefront of artificial intelligence, such as uh, 
ChatGPT, Midjourney, and stuff like that are more like generic tools that everyone can use to do like anything they want. But you have um, also on top of it a, vertical, a verticalization with players who are building specific applications. And so that's what we are doing at Asmona for art and culture because we build AI systems and a system that are made for the visitors and museum staff to help share knowledge easily. Uh, but you have plenty of other startups and players who, who build um, on top of the long language model some specific application. And actually, it's what most players do because there is very few players who build those LLM and the mass market is actually building tools on top of those long language models. So you think it's just a matter of time before that degree of kind of specialization is commonplace and fully and and developed it's 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 coming yes and then i will let uh, everyone talking but there is also an issue of the market again and i think it's because of what we, we were saying the cultural market is seen as a smaller market by people even if we say it's not true and for this reason i think most of the tech innovators are not going to build specific tool for cultures because they see it as a small market. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is sort of bringing up a question for me. Sorry, James. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm also wondering, I mean, as we get further down, as 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 the museum worker on the panel, right? Like as as one of the two, we uh, a, a lot of these conversations are are great, but then how do we show that we can be those that we have the skills and and push it toward our our camp, basically. I right. mean, so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I feel like there's an element of like market maturity where like the first wave, like because the tech is originating, let's say largely from Silicon Valley and the tech industry is trained and use a language yeah. and is set up and is funded so widely differently from the cultural and creative industries that you have like that gap and that gap needs to be bridged. I think there is a second wave of AI tools that are now being tailored and specialized towards that market. Like um, Mario was describing and Mario is a very good example of that. Um, they have been like some of some options would be for governments to intervene right in order for the market to react and to be intervened upon a bit sooner than would naturally occur and we're seeing for example like encouragement of private and public partnerships or funding schemes whether it's research and development funding and even tax relief scheme that's encouraging private entities to move into that space that they wouldn't go into naturally because it's perceived as a for a business case to for want of a better word um which i don't think is true at all but it's a perception it's like another bias the tech industry has they're like do you have scale not really not like consumer scale like everybody at home with their computer right um but that doesn't mean there's not money to be made because those are very buoyant industries regardless of how they're funded and how they're structured and things like that those which you mean the cultural industry yeah, or cultural industries, yeah, because once you work with heritage, you know, heritage is one of many that have a lot of akin and sister values and sister needs, right? Because your need for high quality, high accuracy, cleanly licensed data provenance and transparency, you know, requirements, which a consumer doesn't necessarily have when they're playing with ChatGPT and, you know, comfort of their home for personal purposes, but as a innovator, <laughs> like as a museum curator, you do as a film producer, you do as a video game designer, you do. So once we see more interest and sort of, um, uh, investment attention going down that track it's possibly will cross fertilize across, uh, the board, which would be really exciting, which we're starting to see calm, but we need those like new players and new entrants to survive the big giants, right? Yes. So they need to be propped by government in that way, I think. But I'm French, so of course, I think government intervention makes sense. <laughs> so I would say in the United States, <clears throat> a lot of museums, while they do receive some government intervention, I think it's different than it is in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, the it, it falls on the individual museums here to take that into their own hands and not depend on the on the government intervention we need to mm -hmm. um, be a little bit creative and be um be uh, be 
be creative, be, be, um, you know, on, I guess on the forefront, you know, try to be experimental with what we're doing um, but without, in order to then get some of those grants and government money that may help fund us later down the road. So let's go there. So as an under-resourced sector of the economy, despite its contribution, as you point out from the AAM report, it's, it's, it, it, its contribution is not matched by its resourcing. So as so what is the best practice then it, to, in response to that situation, which is probably not unique to the to the cultural sector in the US, but I, I think it's an under-resourced sector in many places. So this goes to the question of it, the role of AI as an equalizer. How can it play that role? Well, I'm really interested to hear about the US experience. I could speak perhaps to the UK where I'm based. So I, I see that a little bit more where actually the most, I would say, productive and innovative use have come so far from less well-resourced organizations that didn't feel they had the leverage to go knock on the door of IBM, Microsoft, or those ones to set up a shiny PR partnerships and also a bit of a tech partnership for them. So what they ended up doing, and that worked quite well, is they used... Um, open source AI tools, which does require some tech skills, like it is not user friendly if you're not, you know, either confident or curious or trained in computer science. And they asked actually the nearest university computer science department to and say, look, we're seeing all of these promises about AI, we understand some of it is open source and open access. What is realistic for us to do with what's available cheap and with the state of our digital collections or digital infrastructures as well, which is another factor in the equation. And what has come through is actually really keen response from university and college departments where they allocate students for a year long or maybe two year long, you know, experiments and placements and projects. And they basically see what they can integrate from things like Python's or other open source models and tools adapted to their um, really specific asks. So one that's worked really well was how do I uh, refill the catalog of better structure data information within a museum's collection so that it's more accessible and searchable by a user who's not a curator, uh, so yeah. a member of the public or researcher. And that's worked really well on low to no budget, but staff time, which of course is a resource, um, and a lot of in-kind contribution and donation from a university who finds it super interesting because it's a more interesting discipline and subject matter than the usual data sets they get to work on, which is usually insurance data or financial data, et cetera. So they they manage to rally students and like motivate students to work on that really well. Um, and th that has worked quite well um, on our end, like on the UK end. So yeah, it's kind uh, of a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I definitely agree with, uh, with what you say. I, I also think that there is a matter of incentive uh, for the big museums to do some AI projects because sometimes, and it's work for AI, but also for other new technologies, like there is like, I there is already a lot of people coming, like, why should I do it? Um, there is also people who are scared about AI because they have this kind of uh, big visibility. So if they feel that it's going to be uh, very visible and they don't want that at all, so they are oh. super scared and don't want to try something. And on the opposite, you have the smaller What's organization. Oh, sorry, Natia, we, we can Nadia, really can you talk. mute yourself? I know. Thank you. Um, and on the, the opposite side, we have the small organization and some of them have done a kind of a leapfrog to say like, I'm small, I need to be more visible. What can I do with AI to reach this goal? Also, I need to um, differentiate myself from potential competitors and have more media attention. Oh, no, no, so just how why that. Some of them are more attracted about uh, AI projects, even if the kind of dark side of it can be that sometimes you have just type projects that are hid here to attract attention, but who are not built for a long-term kind of a return on, on investment. So there's a, right, so there's a, so you're saying there's almost like a, an incentive for smaller organizations to push harder and to be more innovative. And there is actually an opportunity for them there 
Whereas the larger organizations, because it's public, a public failure kind of makes them a little more, or the possibility of public failure makes them more risk averse. Yeah, piggybacking off that, I mean, James and, and hi everyone, nice to meet y'all. Um, I, I work in public relations, and it's um, you know very interesting time in terms of artificial intelligence. I mean, one one thing that that the media is really not officially supposed to accept any sort of text that's artificial intelligence. So, if someone you know were to submit artificial intelligence text, they actually run it through an AI detector. Uh, to see if if any sort of GBT or sort of stuff has been using. Now, you would think typically that would dissuade a lot of people from using AI and stuff, and it does. But one of the things that people have been doing to combat it is actually been using AI to combat the AI detector. Um, so that's been like kind of one thing that's been a, a little bit on, on the present. And then um, one of the things I noticed when I went to a PR conference where there are a lot of the sponsors and people, I mean, we're a small shop, we're like five people full time, but there's like PR firms that are, you know, thousand person organizations managing fortune 500 companies as clients. And when I was talking to them about like what sort of tech stack they were using to help those clients, it was very interesting because essentially they were saying nothing, like they're not allowed to use anything. They have these compliance regulations. And I mean, there's many ways to interpret that, but my interpretation was like, wow, like I think it provides like, cause you, you can use those art. You, it's hard to argue that you can't use artificial intelligence to provide a higher level of service. So I, I was, I took. Oh, you just lost. So he's basically saying that there's an analog in his industry to this, where the smaller players are the early adopters and the big players kind of are afraid for I mean, regulatory or other reasons that's the privilege of the underdog like you have you know you don't fall from as far as high so you feel like you can take more risks in a way which is good I mean, then you innovate hmm. i think it goes both ways i think some of the bigger organizations do have the staff and the tech know-how and the budgets to be able to try some things and then there are smaller museums and mid-sized museums like the one jane and i are at um, that tend to be sometimes a little more cautious about what they're doing and how they're using these tools. Um, so I, I do think it can go both ways. I do think it AI can often be help with smaller museums as the, the person who just asked the question said he's in a museum with in an organization with five people. I think AI for organizations like that can find itself being very helpful because they've got a small staff. So it might be able to take off some yeah. of the more administrative work that you know a, a larger museum may have the staff to do those things. So. But in terms of kind of best practice, uh, like what about this uh, balance between sort of sustainability, because you have to be really judicious about what choices you make in a small organization. You can't just allocate five people on a, onto a team when you only have, you know, 25. Uh, so what about that sort of balance between sustainability and one-offs uh, or like the, the right size of a project or the right level of ambition? I think at least in my experience, you're gonna find more um, smaller and mid-sized museums using tools that are gonna provide more sustainability long-term um, rather than the flashy things that maybe a bigger museum might have the staff and the developers and the money to pull off those kind of one-off flashy fun things. Um, that's not to say that smaller and mid-sized museums won't do that, but I do think that they are more likely to be looking for things that are going to help with efficiency in their day-to-day -day work. Yeah. So is there, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think there is also the, uh, what are we talking about when we talk about AI? Because most of the time we think about the Public facing uh, flashy projects, uh, as you as you mentioned, which which are the ones that the medias are the most like um, aware about and uh, and want to share also. But you have a lot of uh, boring AI 
that is uh, still uh, very useful, as you were mentioning, for like administrative tasks, also answer to email and to whatever thing to fill some application and stuff like that. Um, so you have a lot of that, which is not as sexy as uh, an AI to do, I don't know what, for your, for your audiences. Uh, but which can be very uh, useful. And there is still also this practice of this practice of shadow IT, where a lot of museum staff use it, even if they are not like officially allowed to, and they lack some training and policy also from the organization. So it's still a work in progress, even for the, the AI that is uh, a little bit like uh, under the water and we don't see that much. Hmm. And right, and that's a good thing you're saying, right? That, uh, but but it's but how how much of that is going on? Do you think? Like, what's the is the cultural sector behind with respect to this kind of boring AI? Um, I would say it's a it's a work in progress, as in uh, lots of other like sector and because the professional needs to have training. So then you have the issue of, uh, do you have the budget to invest in training your staff? And in a lot of cases you don't. Uh, so that could be like a restriction for the, the crucial organizations. But uh, otherwise I think it's still a work in progress to be able with even those kind of generic tools be able, and open source models, be able to find the right use case, the right way to use them. And it's also something that is quite important because of all of the IP issue. For example, if you just use a tool that generates an image for you, but you have like IP restriction and you're not aware about that. And there is also everything about the misuse of AI where it can uh, hallucinate and share wrong information. Uh, and at the opposite, you have a lot of things and a lot of uses of AI that can just open your mind and help you think outside of the box, uh, which people don't usually um, do. Do you think that um, the sort of the old guard in the museum sector is reacting appropriately to this situation of uh, impending dramatic disruptive change? Uh, from at least uh, the U.S. perspective a little bit, again, at our sort of level, um, there tends to be a little bit of a panic, and there also just tends to be a hesitance toward anything digital or learning anything new, which is sort of surprising in a museum sector where you would expect a lot of people to want to be, like, lifelong learners. Um, but there are people that, like, don't want to, like, learn how, like, the difference between SharePoint and OneDrive and that kind of thing. So we're getting past those points, and so, like, I do think that I think there's a, a fear that that may not be warranted because it's inevitable anyway. And I think that as we've talked about it with a lot of this stuff about like opportunities and at versus risks is that like it's it's happening anyway and we're gonna have to be a part of it. And we get we again we could put ourselves in a place where it's really cool to be a part of it. Um, but we do need to get leadership and some of the old guard to just sort of be like, take a deep breath, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> And that's not unique to the heritage sector. Like I see that generational like mindset change in like music in films and performing arts, et cetera. So it's not unique to the heritage sector in that sense. And there's, but there is that element of, um, there's a really, I find a lot of echo in the kind of embracing AI than I see with the embracing the open access movement in a context of digital collections, where there is also like two mindsets where you may have an old guard that's like, oh, we've invested a lot of money into them. We should seek some commercialization of it where we can. And then how could we achieve that versus releasing it and just reap the benefits that come from that, which is very much more, I think, the trend and the thought process of the like the new and coming generation of curators and digital collections managers and that tension which i see replicated with ai and actually a lot of that debate is being rehashed around data mining and bots and digital collections and is it part of the open access movement is it adjacent is it you know a, a separate question well is anyone on this call who is a museum director or a leader who could uh 
kind of chime in on that sort of experience? If no museum directors or leaders are on the call, that's indicative of an issue. <laughs> I have a story. So actually, Nathan here, who's trying to run out of the camera, he, he's part of the story. So, I mean, many years ago when we were sort of working, um, he and one of our other team members, uh, Martino, were, were really pressuring me to use a, a certain program. And, you know, I'm a huge technology proponent. But and I was always resisting it because I was like, I don't want to learn something new. I don't want to learn the new UX UI. I don't want to learn the new thing. Um, and it probably took the two of them probably like heckling me about it, maybe like 60, 70 times before I actually like opened an account, swiped my credit card, paid for it. And I mean, without that program, our, our business is mm -hmm. like, you know, half the size than it is um, now. So I think a lot of time it's like people really need that like repeated, like constructive pressure. I mean, our team, like we can, you can bark a little more aggressively at me than maybe some other people. So that, that point applies, right? That, so so what, what we're saying is that the people on this call need to talk to their museum directors and the leaders of their, their uh, you know, whatever, IT or, and say, hey, this is something we need to actually do something about. Um, so what's the right way to, to make that recommendation? Any thoughts? I mean, at least what works in, in, in our industry, coverage is currency. So if, if you can get somebody or a client coverage, um, we can monetize it. Um, any sort of opportunity to get coverage that we're not getting someone coverage, there's a huge lack of. What do you like, mean? What do you mean by coverage? So like, like, like if we get people coverage, good coverage, we don't get fired. I mean, that's our, our job is to get people news coverage. Okay, but so um, for the museum, so what's the analog for the museum sector? So, so right, as, so what, so that, for what Nathan, he spoke to me in language of coverage. So whatever the like currency of the museum is, whether that's, hey, we can get more people to come, we can get people to pay extra for this exhibit. I think if you speak in that narrative and say, hey, here are some ways Jared. that I use AI to, to, to like, you know, make things, you know, pain points that we're having at XYZ organization more efficient, that that could be a way um, to, to kind of get through to people. Right. So the carrot approach, here's the benefits. Here's a here's a concrete, tangible, perhaps bottom line benefit that could be achieved if we were to adopt this wholeheartedly. Has that worked for anyone? I, yeah, I think it's, I mean, what I've seen, I'm not directly working on the ground with museums. I usually, I'm because I'm a lawyer by training, I'm usually, in, I'm there at the point of soothing the worries of the board, or there's a contract that's put in place in one way or another funding to be received to do something related to AI. Um, and it, what usually like presenting the benefits that impacts the bottom line or achieves advances the mission in a meaningful way that is already set by the museum and the institution helps and then say also the risks are these, we will manage them and we will prove it to you by doing a pilot, a small pilot that we will sandbox so it will be contained to that particular part, activity, section of the museum and we will show you the results and with that receipt we can scale, go forward and you'll have a say in killing it if it doesn't work or expanding and investing more time, resources, money into it um, if it does. And that seems to have worked. Nice. Uh, I agree with, with what Matilda just said. And I want to kind of add, and I know at our museum, Jane and I have discovered that a lot of people don't, there's a fear around AI. I think there's always a fear around any sort of new technology, but I do think there is a fear around AI. And part of allaying that fear, I guess, is understanding that it's already here, that we're already using it. When people say, oh, oh I'd never use AI. It, it's interesting to point out that they, they are using it, they just don't realize it, whether it's a chat bot or um, spell check or, you know, suggesting on search engines, they, they are using it already. So we just need to figure out how we are going to best use it. Hmm. And that you're not alone, right? That there is a network of organizations and institutions that are looking at similar things to you, that you can learn from their mistakes or their wins and losses as you go along with yours. I think that's a huge help in that process. 
So what are the risks? We talked about kind of reputational risks and, and I guess museums as holders of trust within society have uh, to pay attention to reputational risks. Uh, so what are the the risks for the cultural sector in in adapting and adopting and de diving deeply into AI? I think once you're doing um, carefully what you're doing, you can limitate uh, a lot of risk because I would say in terms of uh, damaging the reputation and everything, the first risk uh, could be to have like uh, when you're doing something which is like public facing at some point uh, to have some AI hallucination or uh, he ha AI uh, arming someone or hurting someone by saying something that is not appropriate. And this risk, uh, you can more and more mitigate it with some technologies that allows you to have some contained uh, knowledge base for the AI and you can make sure it's not going out of it. So I think this kind of initial risk we had with artificial intelligence of the potential of nonsense it was going to share um, is more and more contained, then I think you have to work a lot on the pedagogy of what you're doing and the transparency so that, again, if you're doing something with uh, like public facing, your audience know that they are talking to an AI, your AI adds the right tonality, uh, so you can have like some, I would say, start to people who start to be maybe too attached to it or to have like kind of interaction you don't want them to have with your artificial intelligence. Um, and I think here yeah, for each risk, uh, there is an issue, there is a, a solution. I, I, I don't see like a particular risk that can't be addressed. Mm -hmm. Should there be, so what's the right kind of policy or practice approach to address those risks? You got, I know that you're developing policy at your museum. You want to talk about that? Yeah, um, we're working on developing some. We're not calling it, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not calling it policy. We're calling it guidelines mm -hmm. because this is a field that's changing so quickly. We feel like a policy gives it a sense of it being set in stone. And with guidelines, we want, these are just things we want people to consider. You know, whether it's, you know, these are the risks, these are the opportunities that we have for using this tool, and it is just a tool. Um, and we want to, to give our staff the opportunity to use those tools creatively, but to use them with these ethical things and ethical ideas and our mission behind it. Um, so that's kind of what we're aiming to do when Jane and I are working on this. The other second part of that that's super important is AI literacy. Um, as I said earlier, there are a lot of people who think they don't use it, but they actually are using it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think a basic understanding <clears throat> of what AI is and how it's infiltrating our lives is important for people to understand. Yeah. I mean, um, if we want to be super practical, we can think about, you know, like, what do I do? I want to use AI, whether for an admin task, for a collections management task. I will leave aside the visitor facing activity because that's a little bit more advanced and involved. Um, but I'm here on my computer. What do I do? I mean, the first thing is like, which tool do I use? And so going towards like a specialized and as clean as possible model, like that claims it can give you assurances that are accountable assurances of we've trained on licensed data, et cetera, will kind of take care of your copyright and rights infringement in the training of the tool, which will therefore not taint anything that comes out of it. If that your appetite for that risk is low, then go for a clean model. It's likely to be a higher subscription fee than free, but perhaps it is a trade-off that works for you. Then only input information when you prompt the tool, which is usually what you need to do to get a better specialized, like more useful output for it. If you if upload input, make sure that you can do that, as in there's not confidential, sensitive information, rights, IP privacy of other people, whether 
it's third party or collaborators. And if they are, then ask permission. And then anything that comes out of the tool, then check it. Like it can't go out even to your colleagues without you giving it a read because of the hallucinations, errors, biases that Marianne mentioned that can be in it. That will be for a forever risk because of how the tech works. This is a statistical model. So it, it only predicts, but it's not accurate. Like, you know, you would write it from scratch and then label that indicate somewhere alongside that, that this was part AI generated. And it's not to name and shame you. It's actually to protect you, to be like, Hey, I've used this tool to get this to you faster and probably better or more of it, whatever it is. Um, is AI generated? I've read it, you know, because it's part of my best practice, but there could still be gremlins in the work. And people are usually fine with that. Like, and usually when you do that, you've kind of taken care of a lot of the risk. And then in the meantime, you're doing a bit of AI, teaching or literacy because you're telling your colleague you know I've used this tool for that and just letting you know this has been partly AI generated or completely AI generated we've adopted that with all of our published writings they, we have an AI statement or an AI free statement that clarifies exactly how and at what stage and to what degree it was used mm. and uh, do you get feedback on that or what or tension we have <laughs> what sorry I said, or tension, you know. No, nothing, nothing. I, I, uh, it, it, it's interesting. We are, you know, anyone who writes for us, we've asked them to sort of be clear about the process and what stages and how it was used. Um, and uh, I think it makes people more conscious about the way they use it, which makes the work better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the answer because we are talking about uh, wanting to restrict the use of AI. And as you were mentioning before, Michelle, you can't and it's here. But I, and also I was thinking about some uh, cultural organizations that have applicants uh, sharing AI generated uh, content uh, to the to the files and for them it's uh, it's very bad and they want to prevent it. And we were talking earlier about those kind of tools who check if it's like AI generated. And I think this kind of cat and mouse uh, thing yeah. is not really useful because at some point people are using it, it's here. So I think it's more interesting to work on the transparency and ask people to declare what they did with AI or how they use it. Um, than just trying to uh, prevent it. Because like, if you say, can save a lot of time writing something not that much necessary with AI, but then you have the right approach and you rewrite it and you adapt it and everything, why you, would you present, uh, prevent yourself doing it? Like, uh, there is no point. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting tension. So, so AI is, is um, it's like, at some level, both something that becomes a competitive requirement, like, so you will be put at a disadvantage if you are not using AI in some professional capacity, but it's also, there's a pride in not using AI and somehow that this has no interface with AI and that this is a good thing. So there's a, there's an internal tension there. But at the same time, I'm not saying you are supposed to use AI all the time. And I think there is some also decisions that are important to think, for example, whether you're going to ask for like a graphic designer to do something for you or ask an AI tool to generate some specific image. And I think it's interesting also for museum professionals, even if they have limited resources and everything we said before, uh, to think about this kind of balance in terms of ethics. Like, when do I want to make a human work for my museum? Or when do I think it's be better to give that to an AI? And I think this balance is important. Um, so it's, but it's more like a, an ethical approach than um, just like, a way to uh, to want to stop AI no matter what. Mm -hmm. I think, I think one, it goes oh, back to go ahead, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just like one of the things I think on the on the ethical front. I think from a from a vendor perspective or someone who uses AI is like, you know, we we in our world we we don't in our contracts like we haven't actually asked. None of our clients have asked us to you know put any sort of AI requirements. To, it, it's not really spoken about too much. Um, some of our meetings, people have been like, wow, this is really good. Like, did you use AI to generate it? And, and, and we say, yes, uh, of course, we, we used it. But one thing I'm always like pretty 
I, I try to describe to people is because I, I don't want people thinking like, hey, we just did like two clicks and, and wrote this thing. I mean, we've put a decade of like just in me, like I've worked in the PR industry for, for 10 years writing and editing till my hands were bleeding. So I think, you know, there's still a lot of effort and creative thought that has to be put into it. Um, and, and I just like, I'm very aware of just like kind of, you know, making sure that people understand that we're, we're using it to increase the quality of, of what we do rather than to like fully um, replace it. I mean, we still employ so many writers and uh, media professionals. And, you know, though the job may have shifted a little bit in technology, the, the, the essence of it is, is the same. And, and, and as, as I think a few of you guys mentioned, I think really, you know, saying, hey, you have to check quality for content is really important, stressing that you do do that. I mean, the media, we always say nothing will be published without your approval. That's just like a statement that just quells anxiety for people all the time. Um, and even in the past, like month, month and a half, just the quality of, of the lack of hallucin hallucinations, AI's ability to cite sources has improved substantially and also its capabilities to to comment on PhD level intelligence and such. So it's, it's continuously improving. Um, and, and I think, yeah, you also just have to mirror like people's responses, get, get a sense of like, are they really anti-AI or are they, you know, have they used it a lot? Um, and kind of just like work with people with where they're at and not try to push people beyond their, you know, respective boundaries, if that makes sense. Mathilde, you were gonna say something? I mean, it was, um perhaps a bit past, but one of the probably top skills that is coming through is uh, perhaps not so much to be the best at prompting AI and becoming the, you know, prompt engineer of the next century, but to discern, like discerning what should be AI assisted versus what should be human led and made. And that discernment being like one of the top skills to acquire and that requires some AI literacy, of course, that combined with your ability to manage change and are supposed to be like in your institutions, the top uh, in your sector will likely be the top two skills that will cut across any sector is likely to be. In the first uh, webinar, they said that uh, developing AI prompting skills is largely ephemeral because the, the the because it's changing too fast for that to be useful knowledge that that that's going to change so rapidly that it's not really. Uh, a place to spend your energy. I think your sort of curation and management. So this is about the collaborative phase of AI, right? Collaboration between humans and AI, uh, which is, that, as I understand it, the intermediary phase. <laughs> we, we're in adolescence. So what happens when that progresses? beyond our need for being the moderator and the curator. Personally, I don't believe at all in uh, general AI things and uh, and the thing, the singularity and the things that AI is going to replace human and th all of those literacy. Um, I don't believe at all in it. Uh, so I don't know if it's something like whether you have to believe or not in it. Mm -hmm. But um, you have a lot of also scientific literacy showing that all of the time with AI, you have those periods of high progress and then it's falling apart and then it's progressing again. So I think there is all of this. And it's also something we had from... Um, uh, culture and science fiction and those kind of narratives towards AI, but it doesn't mean that, I think because we are culturally infused of those narratives, we want to believe it's going to happen this way, but I, I don't believe it's the way it's going. So can you talk about how you, how you think it's going, like where it's going? I think it's, um, you probably already uh, have seen this kind of uh, hype cycle um, curve from Gartner, where I think well, close to the very top of generative AI and maybe even starting to fall down again. Uh, and what is very interesting is that when it's a hype, like everybody talks about that all the time, everybody wants to do AI and everything. And I think we are still in this phase, but then when it starts to slow down, uh, so we talk less about AI, but uh, it starts to really uh, enter into the everyday life of people and everyday life too. So it's less shiny, but it becomes very useful. 
and what you keep in the end is the useful. So I think it's the way it's going to, to evolve. Mm -hmm. And it's I totally not just... agree. Sorry. No, please. No, I was going to say, I totally agree with what Marion yeah. just said. I, I, I do think there's that curve. Um, I can't remember the terms that I had seen it in a chart before where, you know, it, the hype goes up and then the despair comes down and then at some point it levels out and people just kind of come to terms with it. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with what, what she said. Um, there's, it's, yeah. it's a thing that people are going to, I think it kind of like when we first started using email, you know, uh, people were like, oh no, I'd never use that. I want to talk to people. Well, it's just, it's, it's a change. It's just something that we're going to have to incorporate into our day-to-day -day work. I mean, and I don't just... think we should feel bad also for, sorry, for the heritage sector, not necessarily knowing exactly how they could use AI for, because I'm not sure AI developers know where their own technology will perform best. I think it's put out and I think it's for users to test, repeat, integrate, da, 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 and shows where the technology works best and open up those use cases and business cases. Hmm. I was just going to share an idea, but uh, based on what you just said, Michelle, um, the comparison with email is interesting because we never thought we are going to be replaced by email. I think like AI <laughs> is as bring by email, but when you say that about an email, it seems like, oh, like, what do you think an email is going to do the, to work for you? Um, so yeah, just sharing it. I, I, yeah, that may, that's a, that's a good that may be a false that may be a false analogy though it may be an analogy it, on the human side that e email in our adoption curve is following a similar pattern but fundamentally email is a, is a it, if if you think of ai as purely a a functional augmentative technology like email that underrepresents its impact oh yeah and it's probably not the best analogy, but it's the one off the top of my head. But yeah, and I do think that AI is, is there's been a fear that, that AI is going to replace humans. And I really don't think that's going to be an issue. I think we're always going to have the need for humans. Well, but, I think humans need to change their skills. Not, but no, it's, I don't think, I don't think that's the right frame. It's not that AI will replace humans, but there are certain domains of human activity that can be far better realized via AI rather than sort of typical human capacity. So, the, yeah. Definitely, but for, for this, I think that AI is like Excel or PowerPoint. I think it's really this kind of tools we use all the time. Like Excel is very useful when you want to run a company. Like without Excel, I don't know how you do. But Excel is boring. Like we are not thinking like Excel is going to erase the humanity. And I think it's good to be able to compare AI with those kind of tools who are very useful in the everyday life, but for, which we are not scared at all about. But there I, I join James's point in terms of there will be domains that will be eradicated, either professions and skills. And that doesn't mean that skill of those humans will not find somewhere, you know, other activities connected to what they know how to do in their trade, but it will significantly change their income source. Like emails probably significantly impacted on the postal services, you know, Christmas cards and e-cards now are, you know, it's a fact. So there are pockets of the industry, the sector or sectors that will be impacted. I think AI, if you think of translation, many translators will tell you now I'm a deep editor. It's called deep translation because it's first generated with AI, then edited by uh, a, tran a translator. Great tool at the beginning for the last 10 years, make them work better and quicker, etc. But a lot of translators will tell you I'm retiring because the amount That's of it. only human or translation work I'm interested in that is going is shrinking so bad that a lot of them will be redundant and therefore their skills will go in other parts of of the market, I'm sure. And same with uh, voiceovers. There are a lot of the highly commercial, low creativity voiceover work is being replaced by AI tool in a way that is so fast, so quick, and also so good, you know, to be completely honest. But it means it evaporates a source of income that allows them to do independent theater work, you know, other low earning or completely free charity work. So there, there will be systemic impact in in places but i don't think it will be as radical i agree with you Mario. it won't be like everybody's 
in service businesses will be yeah out of a job. and I'm, I'm i'm not lowering, lowering the societal impact and again if i go back to this um comparison with words let's say uh you had some secretary that used to uh, copy to type things that people were saying then and to type it with uh, with a machine and today everybody's using a computer and you don't need a secretary to to do it for you so those kind of jobs the secretaries still exist but do something else and less and less people have secretaries too and it's the same with electricity before for example in paris you used to have people that were here to uh, light every night uh, the light bulb uh, because you, you need someone to do it and then with the electricity they completely disappear so mm -hmm. of course uh, there is an, a societal impact and an impact on the creative work and as you mentioned i think it's very important to be aware of it because if we don't going back to what we say about the ethical approach if we don't take care of it those people are going to lose and lose and lose activity and then they are going to do maybe something else uh, if they are not allowed to live again with their creative jobs and if they do something else then i think um, we start to, to lose something also and to lose also people who could produce data to enrich the ai so i think there is a bad circle that can um, start to happen uh, when the AI takes too much of the like activities of creative people who then are not allowed to, to live on, on those kind of additional activities they are do for a living. So oh. let's bring this to the museum sector. So what are the specific impacts that we're going to see in the in the in museum practice as a consequence of the sort of inevitable adoption. Maybe. Sorry. Sorry. I just uh, I can see sort of those like um, lower level kind of entry level positions being really impacted. Um, the the trainees, the assistant curators, the the folks that are coming in and do a lot of that admin work might have some sort of displacement. There might not have that sort of like level of like apprenticeship kind of working up the same way. And that's that's also been a trend with like tech initiatives and innovations is is that sort of level gets sort of pushed out. Um, additionally, there are also just the idea of creatives in the art world that we work with. We have to deal a lot now with like, how are we managing artists coming in using AI within their work and how is that going to play out? And curators are, are having a real, real fun time working through that. So I think there are some really, really on the ground stuff happening right now that, that might kind of shape the world that we live in, in, in museums for a while. Mm hmm well, I remember 10 years ago having a knockdown, drag out argument with some museum professionals at an AAM conference about uh, artificial intelligence as it relates to creativity and that it had no potential impact on the creative process. So that was the position. Uh, at, this wasn't 10 years ago. This was six years ago that, that it, it could not possibly affect the creative process because this was exclusively the domain of humans. And we know that to be patently false. So I think our, our predictions are going to be grossly inadequate to what actually transpires. But we should try anyway, right? I I also think, hi, I'm Ruth from Mexico, hi. Museo Homex. Hi. I, I also think that as a museum, we work with public and we are here for the public. And I think this is something that uh, that is not, uh, how do you say, reemplazable. We cannot replace by any other intelligence, you know, because it's the treat with the public. And I think that's why we are here. So in terms of strategies and communication and to make essays and all that, it can be helpful. But in the end, the way we collaborate with public and the way we open the doors of the museum for them, I think is we can only do as humans. So this human dynamic, the human relationship, the human interaction between uh, human beings and between humans and real objects, you're, you're saying this is the kind of a, a longer range exclusive domain for the museum sector. I'm um, so. guessing, sorry, I'm guessing if uh, humans are going to be the kind of a premium experience, like uh, for low quality, if I can say it like that, assistance 
you're going to have a lot of AI uh, as interlocutors, but for some of kind of high quality interaction, you're going to have humans. Maybe something is going to, to evolve around this idea. Yeah, that's interesting. Like the um, market segmentation. And, and Jane, I thought what you brought up was really interesting in terms of like how and I feel it too, like in terms of how AI has impacted people's life. I think any business you don't want to, regardless of whether you're a museum or any sort of business, you don't want to train new talent to have to come in. So once you're an industry expert in that industry, um, I think you can really like solidify yourself um, and having a role there. I think it's a really challenging time, like like people often allude to for young people coming straight out of school, because a lot of those jobs that like drudgery kind of make a pitch deck, like do this sort of BDR work isn't necessarily needed as much through BDR work, but the organizations where people have been working for a year at least, I think if you're a good team member, if you're value oriented, um, hopefully knock on wood, job is not too much um, at risk. But I think for new people trying to enter the industry without that experience, or if they're just like, give me a job and they're saying they don't know anything about the industry, you really have to convey yourself um, as like a knowledge expert in that industry. Um, and I think it, it really helps people land and retain work. You mean to, to convey yourself as a, as an expert in AI, as an industry, like, what, what? Um, I mean, I mean, more specifically towards like, 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 let's say you're, you're working in a museum. If you know a lot about the artists who are locally exhibited or something, you know, about that local, you know, community, right. um, and you're not just going in like you're you know, inept with information. I think a lot of people looking for jobs who are who are new, they're, they're just kind of like focusing on the wrong things. Instead of their impact, they're like um, just focusing on, you know, looking for work. And from people I've, I've noticed who are struggling, at least to learn jobs. Most people under 30, in my experience, don't actually know what they're good at in their 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 so their own self interpretation of their of, of their own expertise is often uh, inadequate. Like they they don't realize what they're really good at. That's part that's part of the part of being in a career is to learn what you're good at. But Absolutely. I wonder if we if we worried about losing the groundwork to AI, which would be your entry into a career, is because that's how we learned. But then there will right. be another way to learn whatever we do that we can't imagine because we're not quite in that future space yet. Because uh, if I think of how I was taught versus how I taught in university, the last 10 is vastly different. Do we turn out less lower quality graduates for it? No, like we still have the same. Uh, so I'm hopeful that it, the same will happen, although it's worrying to think that we won't have those entry jobs in the same way if it's partly automated or something. I think the main concern is having leaders in organizations think that efficiency gains by AI are just to be pocketed as opposed to redistributed. I don't think it's a high risk for heritage That's organization, huge. but it's a risk in other sectors, perhaps more, but maybe I'm misguided in thinking. I feel like the heritage usually always, any savings is just reinvested immediately rather than like pocketed and because you don't have the shareholder to like send the benefits to through dividends. Uh, but yeah. I think that's a really important point. Like, so can the cultural sector hold those dividends and reapply them to the to the things that are closer to the mission? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What about um, we touched on this, but uh, and I guess Marianne, you have a very optimistic view. The this sort of the management of bias, um, and sort of as a as an industry that where credibility is kind of one of our primary currencies how do we kind of avoid the various biases that exist kind of in the use of ai um i would say that i'm optimistic uh, in the way that you can handle this problem but it's still a problem it's still an issue uh, that you have to face and if you take like on the shelf tools such as uh, like the, the massive application, ChatGPT uh, and everything, of course that they are biased. And it's something that is um, uh, bad in the long run because of everything we, we know. So you have to try to face that, that issue. But I think in the, in the meantime, as you are a museum and you have like rich collections and also a specific connection with your audiences, 
You can also um, start projects that can address this issue, for example, by creating your own data sets with like underrepresented voices. Um, and I think there is some, it's something you can act on, but you have to, to be careful. And also I'm thinking about um, those the, um, uh, folks that were shared during a, a conference of, of UK museums saying that even your collection can be very biased. And sometimes the AI is uh, just a mirror of those already existing bias. Yeah. And, and as a museum on the bias, I wouldn't say your collections are better. Actually, they're super biased, as you said, because of, and, but what's your real strength is that the people in museums know that as opposed to most other professionals in other sector, like you are knowledge specialists, you understand data, you understand the provenance, it's problems, which is not common as a skill and as like background, which I think is the real strength for the sector going into that transition. Um, and if it could be paired with a bit of confidence, you're in for a treat, but it's getting that up. Yeah. That's a I totally agree with what Matilda just said. I, I think that there is, there is bias in museums, but, and there is bias in AI, but that comes from us. And it's up to us as humans to look at what it's producing and find where that bias is and try to fix it. And um, I think that's always going to there, going to be there. And I think as cultural, um, cult the culture changes and what's, what's okay now may not be okay in 10 years. I think we also have to take that into consideration. We, we work in a mu museum of American art and we look at art that was created in the 1800s and look at how maybe it was described and it may not be very, what we would do today. So, you know, it's not necessarily appropriate to the 21st century norm. So we just have to take those things in consideration at the time that we're doing them and do the best we can. Mm -hmm. But you know that, which is so good. Like I, I was in, because um, one of my core um, interests and personal interests is in like digital cloning. And so often I'm in with like VFX specialists or, or computer scientists who come up with amazing tools to like recreate us so you could start dancing like, I don't know, a ballerina or something or Bruno Mars, if you'd like to even, even if you're a terrible dancer. And they're like, oh, I don't understand why like on... We have glitches like these things don't recreate so well on the female dancer and i was like yes because you use gary the whole time to train the data sets and so gary's body is very unique and they're like oh and you know so that would have never been a conversation i would have had in a heritage like context because I, <laughs> but i could see on your face like you got it instantly and that's like a multi-million investment like into that product right when at the end we're like oh or like a lot of the um, fake motorist or characters or background actors are always guys and i'm like do you realize the gate the size the gaze is different if you don't have a diverse you know, reference point. And again, that those are things I don't think are likely to happen in the heritage sector. So it's a real strength, I think. So that goes back to the place we started, that we need to take a more assertive role in this whole process, right? Because we do have something to bring to the table that's really valuable. Um, so yeah, that, that we are the possessors of... of uh, of of AI gold in a sense, and we need to kind of uh, own up to that. Yep. No, that's really nice. Um, any other last, we have a few minutes left, any other thoughts on kind of policy or practice recommendations or guidelines recommendations to take your cue, uh, Michelle? Uh, so what should be the sort of guidelines that you would put forth for the for the museum sector and its approach? I, I would say, don't be afraid of it. Um, <clears throat> make sure that you are, you do have that human element to it. Be creative with how you're using, using it, but make sure you're also using it in, so that it, it fits with your mission and the museum's ethics and values. Um, those are always going to be important. And I think as museums are keepers of our cultural heritage, as many of us have said, I think it's important that we we um, 
be as accurate and as unbiased and as transparent as possible with how we're using these tools. And as I said, I think it is a tool. It's just one more tool in our toolbox. And I'm going to go around the the, the speakers set, set here. Uh, Marion, anything to add? Mm, I think we already said uh, a lot of things. So I, I hope you're going back from this webinar with a lot of uh, food for folks. Mathilde? I would say use it to improve existing work rather than try to tag on to like create a new program or activities that would be perfectly suited for that particular AI tool that you've come across. Just use it to advance what you've already decided was good, like good work for you to do. And don't involve your lawyers. Like this is not needed. The number of time I've had, let's talk about AI and everybody showed up with their lawyers. And I'm like, this is not the kind of conversation. We'll go down anxiety holes that are not productive. I think you can talk, experiment, play without thinking risk like to the highest degree intensity. Jane? I mean, I'm agreeing with all of this. I think that uh, play is important and trying to encourage your leadership that uh, that it's okay and not scary. And it's okay to, that we don't, that some of the risks that are imagined are a little bit uh, overblown. Um, and yeah, just go back to, we can use this as a really valuable tool or not, um, but I think you're going to be lost if you don't. Mari, Mario, say hello. How you doing? Uh, do you have anything to add? Any of the other people who've been on this call? Any thoughts? Great conversation. Very, very uh, in, uh, interesting for improve the the many uh, tasks for the museums and for here for their workers and and I it's it's incredible to learn about the young people who is here and to know many things about IA. And uh, yes, I'm going to be creative creative, and, and uh, I'm going to have uh, some risk without lawyers, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank right. you for your recommendations. Uh, Ruth, Henrika, anyone? Ivana? It was really helpful. I feel more comfortable of using this great tool. Thanks for everything. Anyone else who was listening in? Uh, Henrika, you've been here the whole time from the very beginning. Any thoughts? No? Okay. Well, thank you all for taking the time to kind of have this conversation. Um, I think it's a useful recording that we made. Uh, hopefully it will be useful to others. We had a pretty good participation during the middle of the session. So um, that's nice. Thanks all of you for promoting it on your networks and uh, and uh, you know giving your sort of thoughts and good energy to this session.